What started off as a seemingly meaningless burglary culminated into the only resignation of a United States president, thanks to the relentless American press and the FBI. The year was 1972, and United States President Richard Nixon was campaigning for his second presidency term. It was widely assumed that he would be elected, but he didn't want to just win. He wanted to win big. He wanted to have the largest margin ever in an election, though ultimately this would be his downfall. On May 28, 1972, five burglars broke into the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate Hotel complex in Washington, D.C., the horses in the house was the code used to indicate that they had broken in. Two of the office phones were wiretapped, and Alfred Baldwin, part of the team of burglars, would listen to conversations in the office for 20 days, but then complications arose with the bugged phones. On June 17, 1972, the team of burglars broke back into the hotel to fix a faulty bug. Hotel security guard Frank Wills noticed that a previously locked door in the complex was taped open and suspected illegal activity. After searching, he found the men in the hotel complex and arrested them immediately. At first, nobody connected the break-ins to the White House, except for two reporters that worked for the Washington Post, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward. They released an article in the day following the burglary that said that former FBI and CIA members Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt, also part of the burglary team, had direct connections to the White House because they were members of the committee to re-elect the president. They received this information from a secret informant, FBI associate, Director Mark Felt, whose identity was not revealed to the public until 2005, and at this time was only known under the code name Deep Throat. For many months to come, he would be an important source of information for Bernstein and Woodward, who would become the prominent reporting team in the Watergate scandal. Then, on August 1, 1972, it was reported by the Washington Post that a $25,000 check from the committee to re-elect President Nixon was deposited in the bank account of one of the burglars. At this point, it was becoming apparent that the Watergate burglars were employed by the committee to re-elect the president, but in an effort to stop more information from being uncovered, Nixon and his chief of staff privately discussed how to get the CIA to tell the FBI to back off of the investigation of the burglary. Still, when questioned by the public, a White House spokesman said that he would not comment on a third-rate burglary, and in reference to the recent Washington Post articles, Howard Hunt said that Woodward and Bernstein have written numerous articles about Watergate. Their stories have contained much fiction and half-truths, and this was the general consensus across the nation because, even though there was substantial evidence to prove otherwise, the public had faith in their president and government. In November of 1973, it looked as though the Watergate scandal was fading away from the eye of the public and press. Nixon was re-elected by the greatest margin ever. He took over 60% of the votes, crushing the Democratic nominee, Senator George McGovern, re in reaching his goal. In the following months, Gordon Liddy and James McCord were convicted of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping in the Watergate incident, and five others involved in the burglary pled guilty. The nation was not at all worried that Nixon may have been involved in the Watergate burglary, but that was only because the convicted men were being paid to keep quiet about the White House's involvement. But that all changed when burglar James McCord wrote a letter to Judge John Sirica saying that he falsely testified due to the fact that he was under great pressure and that the Watergate burglary was not simply a re-election committee operation but involved other government officials. This led to the ensuing investigation of the White House. At this point, Nixon and his staff became very worried about what information would be uncovered by the press. As well as the FBI, John Dean, a White House counsel, told Nixon that there was a cancer on the presidency and about $1 million in so-called hush money will need to be paid to the men who were involved in the burglary in order to keep Nixon safe from the investigation. Worried that information would be exposed, Nixon urged his top aides, H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, and Attorney General Richard Kleindienst to resign, and they did so while John Dean was fired. The Senate began to start televised hearings of the White House members, and John Dean revealed that he had discussed the Watergate scandal cover-up with Nixon more than 35 times. 
During the hearings, Alexander Butterfield, former presidential appointments secretary, testified that since 1971, Nixon had recorded all conversations and phone calls in the Oval Office, and Nixon was asked to give up the recordings, known as the Watergate tapes. However, the Senate had to work to get an official order that would force Nixon to give up the Watergate tapes. Then, on July 18, 1973, Nixon apparently ordered for the White House taping system to be shut down and refused to give the Watergate tapes to the Senate Watergate Committee. His refusal provoked complaints across the nation about Nixon's abuse of power, as Nixon also forced several officials to resign. Then, on the night of October 20, 1973, an event occurred known as the Saturday Night Massacre. President Nixon fired Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox as Attorney General Elliot Richardson and Deputy Attorney General William Ruckelshaus resigned. Nixon had become desperate in his efforts to keep his own name clean. Talk around the nation began that Nixon would face impeachment if he continued to create problems in the investigation, and Nixon's staff began transcribing the Watergate tapes. Then, in November, the Nixon administration announced that there was a problem with transcribing the tapes. Supposedly, Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, was working on the transcripts when she accidentally erased an 18 and a half minute section from one of the tapes, though many believe that this was not an accident and that she meant to erase this section. Nixon then gave a televised speech in which he said to the nation, I am not a crook, and insisted that he was innocent, but the previously naive nation was no longer so. They believed that Nixon had been involved in the Watergate scandal, despite what he said. On February 6, 1974, the Senate finally instructed the Judiciary Committee to consider articles of impeachment for Nixon, and on April 30th, the White House released edited transcripts of the Watergate tapes to the public, avoiding releasing the recordings themselves, though on July 24th, the Supreme Court ordered Richard Nixon to release the tapes. This would be the ultimate piece of evidence needed to prove Nixon guilty. Important evidence would be found in a recording from June 23, 1972, labeled the smoking gun tapes by the press, which proved that Nixon had obstructed justice six days after the burglary. With Nixon saying that the FBI investigation would expose four of the burglars, he said, it would be very detrimental to have this thing go any further. This involves the, these Cubans, Hunt, and a lot of hanky-panky. So, he decided to get the CIA to tell the FBI to stop investigation and simply create a cover story for the burglary. However, the CIA director refused to comply with Nixon's plans. Because Nixon was attempting to interfere with the Watergate investigation, he was breaking the law. On July 27, 1974, the House Judiciary Committee passed an article of impeachment against President Nixon for obstruction of justice. In the following days, two more articles of impeachment were passed for abuse of power and contempt of Congress. With the threat of impeachment, the president became very worried and even mentally unstable at times. On August 8th, he addressed the nation. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. In order to avoid being impeached, he resigned. For the first time ever, a United States president had resigned, and suddenly the American public that always had so much faith in its president was skeptical of their government. These skeptics would make sure that presidential candidates could be trusted, always.